Hello everyone, Team Game here, and today I have the pleasure of bringing you another one of my Football Talk videos, a series where I discuss real life football, be it domestically or internationally, and give my opinions. And today we have had some pretty big news, it has been the release of England's World Cup squad, it was released at 2 o'clock today, although there were some... You know, some picks had been pretty much guessed in advance. Obviously, Ashley Cole retiring from international football last night meant that it was highly, highly likely that Baines and Shaw would be the two left backs, and so it turned out to be. But apart from that, you know, the squad managed to be kept relatively quiet, which is always nice. It's always nice that the manager can come out and name his squad without the press having copies of it beforehand and spoiling the surprise. So. If you guys have been living under a rock today, or like me, you've just come back from work and had an opportunity to have a look at the squad properly for the first time, let me run you through it. In goal, we have Joe Hart, Ben Foster and Fraser Forster. Those are the three keepers chosen. The defenders chosen are Glenn Johnson, Phil Jones, Phil Jagielka, Gary Cahill, Chris Smalling, Leighton Baines, and like I mentioned, Luke Shaw. The midfielders are Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, Jack Wilshire. Jordan Henderson, Adam Lalana, Raheem Sterling, Stephen Gerrard, Frank Lampard, James Milner and Ross Barkley. And then the four strikers are Wayne Rooney, Daniel Sturridge and Danny Welbeck and Ricky Lambert. That was only three strikers. Ricky Lambert is the fourth striker. And obviously all the managers or a lot of the managers are naming a standby list of players. And the seven players named on the standby list by Roy Hodgson are goalkeeper John Ruddy, defender John Flanagan, defender John Stones, midfielder Michael Carrick, midfielder Tom Cleverley, and then two strikers, Jermaine Defoe and Andy Carroll. And I have to say... Broadly, I'm delighted with this squad. Absolutely delighted. I mean, like me and a few friends, about three or four weeks ago, we were on the BBC website where you can basically predict your squad. And we sat down and we were talking about the players we'd take and the ones we'd like to leave out. And broadly, this was the squad we picked. You know, I'm going to run you through you know, position by position who I think is you know deserving of their place and my opinions of it. Starting off with the goalkeepers. Personally, I think these three goalkeepers are the best three goalkeepers England have to offer. Joe Hart is obviously the standout number one. He had a bit of problem earlier this season, you know, a few dodgy performances here and there, threw a few goals in, was a little bit rash charging out, but he's come back to his best. If anyone saw him make those two absolutely unbelievable saves against Everton, Man City versus Everton at Goodison Park, which basically won Manchester City the league, those you know those saves like an incredible save from Stephen Naismith rushing out tipping it around the post unbelievable he's really come on leaps and bounds Ben Foster's been a very very solid keeper for a number of years he retired from international football briefly but has come back and I have to say he's been very very solid for West Brom for a number of years now thoroughly deserving of his place and Fraser Forster for me Fraser Forster should be England's number two if heaven forbid Joe Hart picks up a serious injury and can't start I would like to see Fraser Forster start for England he has been magnificent for Celtic in the Champions League you know his performances against Barcelona absolutely incredible saves he is a man mountain of a human being as well unbelievable you know how massive he is yet how lithe and agile he is some of the saves he makes are incredible and like I mentioned he's so commanding under the high ball crosses set pieces he's very very good because of his height and his presence so those three goalkeepers you know thoroughly deserve their place John Ruddy very solid goalkeeper again you know goalkeepers is one of the positions England has always had a lot of talent at we've never been short of a decent goalkeeper or two so John Ruddy can count himself a little unlucky he's had a reasonable season with Norwich I think it's 11 clean sheets he's kept this season which for a club that's been relegated is not a bad effort at all you know he's very very solid but unfortunately I think it's just come with the fact that he's played for Norwich you know a side that's gone down you know I think he's definitely a Premier League standard goalkeeper I would be very surprised to see him still at Norwich next season but you know, that's the goalkeepers. You know, you've got to drop some people. So I think the three goalkeepers that have been chosen are the right ones. I'm very, very pleased. Now, let's talk about the defenders now. Obviously, Kyle Walker's been left out of the squad because of his long-term pelvic injury. So that meant right-back was always going to be an interesting position. And the two right-backs chosen are Glenn Johnson and Chris Smalling. I think Chris Smalling has been included in this squad because of his versatility. You know, he can play centre-back, he can play right-back. He has not had the greatest season at Manchester United. But he's he's a talented young player, there's no doubt about that. I think he's probably the player I'm least sure about being in this squad. Personally, I would have liked to have seen John Flanagan get taken. You know, He's in the, the seven standby players. He's had a really good second half of the season with Liverpool. And the good thing with Flanagan as well, he's shown his versatility. He plays left back and right back very, very effectively. He's good going forward. And it would have been nice to see him on the plane. Because like I mentioned, I don't think Smalling's played particularly well this season. 
but we've already got two left backs on the plane. Smalling can play right back and centre back. Perhaps that's the versatility Roy Hodgson was looking for. So yeah, again, you can't really argue about that. And obviously, Glenn Johnson will probably start for England. Very, very good going forward. One of the best attacking fullbacks in the country. Obviously, he is. Otherwise, he wouldn't be in the World Cup squad. But very, very solid. And again, playing in the Liverpool team that have had a huge amount of success this year. And oh, sorry about this. I have had a little bit of gas staging, you can probably tell. I've got a bit of a sore throat. So if I keep swallowing every now and again, I apologise that. I'm just trying to stop myself from ripping a huge burp down the mic, which I doubt will go down very well with anyone. So those are the right backs covered. Let's move now into the central defence. Like I mentioned, you know, Chris Smalling can cover this position well as well. You've got Phil Jagielka and Gary Cahill who are going to be the starting centre backs. Gary Cahill has been outstanding this season for Chelsea. Has been absolutely magnificent. Named in many people's player of the season. Very, very good. He's looked very assured alongside John Terry as well. He's got a lot of pace. He's good on the ball, decent in the air, good tackler. You know, he's a good player. And I'm every time I see Gary Cahill play, I get more and more disappointed that we sold him from Aston Villa. You know, he he's just been magnificent. He's grown year after year. He's become better and better. And I think he's a really good centre back now. And alongside him it's going to be Phil Jagielka, obviously start him. It's good news. You know, came back from an injury quite late on in the season. You know, started his first game against Manchester City, I think it was actually for a, a good you know, period of months out to come back and perform very, very well. You know, Jagielka is not the fastest, but you know, we've got Cahill alongside him for a little bit of pace. And our two fullbacks, be it Baines and Johnson, will probably be the starting fullbacks. They don't like pace either, so Jagielka's lack of, of pace isn't really a problem in that lineup. Very solid, you know, good leader as well. He's a, a leader in that Everton team, and I think he'll, he'll do very, very well. And then. The backup centre-back is Phil Jones. Again, a player picked for his versatility. Can play centre-back, can play right-back, can play in midfield, can play holding midfield. You know, very, very versatile. And when you've only got 23 players to call on, having a player like Phil Jones in the squad is vital. And, you know, I, this is one of the things, you know, quite a few of my friends were arguing that we shouldn't have picked Phil Jones. And I completely disagree. I think Phil Jones definitely deserves his place in the team. Like I mentioned, you know, Manchester United haven't played particularly well this season. Phil Jones is one of those players, again, who's underperformed. But that's the entire club who's underperformed. You know, Manchester United didn't finish 7th because of Phil Jones. Not That's not the case at all. And his versatility is definitely something England will need. So I'm delighted to see him in the side as well. And then left-backs, Leighton Baines and Luke Shaw. Leighton Baines thoroughly deserves it. He should start. He's an incredible player. You know, So threatening as well. And this is what we need. We've got so many attacking players in this team. And this is what I really like about this squad. Got a lot of pace, a lot of direct players who want to get the ball down on their feet and run at people and create chances and cross and he's just an outstanding modern fullback. And then he's back up Luke Shaw, you know, one cap he's going to get a lot more than one cap I can tell you that. Personally I would have liked to see Ashley Cole get taken but I can thoroughly understand why Luke Shaw was chosen by Hodgson because you know, Luke Shaw has been outstanding this season he broke through about halfway through last season made, I think it was 16 appearances he had last season and this season over 30 appearances. He's done very, very well again. Proper modern fullback. He's powerful. He's pacey. He loves to get forward. He creates chances. He's an outstanding player. The only reason why I'd like to see Ashley Cole is if, heaven forbid, Leighton Baines breaks his leg you know, and we're up against a Brazil or a Spain or a Germany, it would be very reassuring to have Ashley Cole just to step in there because I don't remember Ashley Cole having a bad game for England. I really don't. And for some reason, Jose Mourinho didn't want to play him much towards the end of last season. But you saw in the big games, you know, Ashley Cole got wheeled out and he's always been a dependable player for England. You know, we've underperformed in a number of tournaments, but the reason why is it has nothing to do with Ashley Cole. You know, Ashley Cole's a very, very good player. 107 England caps, a proper England legend. Probably the best left back we've ever had. And. Luke Shaw could run him close for that, both his number of caps and both for the uh, best left back we've had as well. So that was a really tough decision. And Hodgson again said it was probably the toughest decision of his career, leaving Ashley Cole out. And I would have liked to see him in the squad, but we've got two outstanding left backs there. So that completes the defence. Moving into midfield now, Alex Oxlade Chamberlain. I'm pleased that Roy Hodgson has picked players like Chamberlain, you know, young, pacey, direct wingers who love to get on the ball and run. And the good thing with Chamberlain as well, he's shown his versatility at Arsenal this season. Quite a few times, Arsene Wenger's asked him to play in a central midfield role here. He played it away in the Champions League against Bayern Munich and was Arsenal's most dangerous player. Now, he's a very, very talented young player. And again, you've got to look at our opposition. We're going to be playing against Italy in the group stage in Manaus, in a boiling, boiling hot Manaus. And 20 minutes to go, who do we want to bring off the bench? Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain is an outstanding player to do that because he can run players ragged. 
you know, very, very talented player. And he will do well for us, I think, in the World Cup. You know, alongside him, we've got Jack Wilshire, one of his Arsenal teammates. Wilshire came back again. He's had another injury ravaged season. That's basically what you get with Jack Wilshire these days, just injury after injury. But he did play in the last game of the season, which I think was important just to show Roy Hodgson his fitness. He's got a few friendlies as well where he can play and get a bit more match practice and get himself to a little bit of a sharper standard before the tournament kicks off. So, again, Jack Wilshire has been one of those players who, when he's been in a big game for England, you know, when he, we played against Germany and Brazil, he was one of the players who really stood out. He's a top-class player. If he didn't keep getting crocked every week, he'd be an outstanding player. But that's a bit unfortunate how he gets injured. But when he's fit, when he's firing... He's a player I, I really enjoy watching and again, someone who can be very, very useful for us. The next player is somebody I never, ever think I'd be glad to see in a World Cup squad, Jordan Henderson. You know, when Jordan Henderson moved from Liverpool to Liverpool from Sunderland, sorry, for £20 million, he was dreadful. You know, He really had a bad season. He was played wide by Kenny Dalglish. It didn't work. He didn't seem to be bothered. He just he really fell flat that first season, and he was you know he was a figure of fun basically for a large section of fans in this country, you know alongside Andy Carroll and Stuart Downing, these big signings, it it all seemed to have flopped basically. That's what it looked like, but I have to say Brendan Rodgers has got the best out of Jordan Henderson, and he's turned into a key player for Liverpool now. You know he's mobile, he's good on the ball, he'll put a challenge in, he gets forward, he's a, he's a proper box to box midfielder, and that's something again I like you know midfielders who will put a shift in but not just aimlessly chug around you know he will get the ball down and pass and move and create and that's very very useful and I really do like seeing Jordan Henderson in this squad very very good player you know two of the players who are great the wingers Lalana and Sterling like I mentioned with Oxley Chamberlain we're going to be playing against an aging Italy squad, Italy team in Manaus born in hot temperatures we need these players to stretch them you know, Sterling and Lalana have both had outstanding seasons you know again Raheem Sterling 12 months ago Nowhere near the England team. Promising youngster, but no more than that. But again, Brendan Rodgers has found a way to get the best out of Raheem Sterling. He's been outstanding this year, really has. And what can you say about Adam Lallana? No, he, he's Southampton's player of the season, absolutely outstanding. You know, He's gone in many people's team in a year, created a host of chances, scored goals, linked with a big money move to Liverpool. You know, there's only good, good things to hear about Adam Lallana. He's had a fantastic season. Again, I'm glad to see him in the team. Next three players I'm going to talk about are more of the experienced core of the side. Steven Gerrard, he's just a guaranteed starter, isn't he? Absolute England legend, phenomenal player. He's dropped a bit deeper now into this holding role. Slightly less dynamic than he used to be, but his range of passing is incredible. And he is you know, a proper leader for club and country. Great player to have in the team. And alongside him again, we've got Frank Lampard. Now, I can't see Frank Lampard playing much. But again, experienced player, has plenty of England caps, plenty of tournament experience. And we're going into this tournament with a lot of young players, a lot of people who've got not many England caps. And having someone like Lampard around, a little bit of calming influence is a good decision, I think. You know, When I was sitting down making my mock squad, I didn't put Frank Lampard in, I put Michael Carrick in ahead of him. But over the last like two months of the season, Michael Carrick has really begun to drop off. And with Frank Lampard, you know exactly what you're going to get. You know, you're going to get that experience. You're going to get that desire and drive. You know, he's a very, very good competitor, Frank Lampard. I can remember when he came on against Poland in, in the qualifiers. He had a dreadful game, but you know he brought down Robert Lewandowski to take that yellow card for the team to, to basically win us the game and get us qualified. And that's basically what Frank Lampard will do. He will take a yellow card. He will put his body on the line. He will you know work hard for the England and for Chelsea. And that's the sort of player you want in a tournament. So... Again, I can understand why. I probably would have gone for Michael Carrick, but you can't fault Hodgson for this choice either. A few very, very tight decisions. And then the third more experienced player, James Milner. Again, like I mentioned about Frank Lampard, James Milner is somebody who will work very hard and he will work even more than Lampard does. You know, Milner is a proper workhorse. He can play wide. He can play central defensive midfield. You know, if we had an absolute disaster and we had all of our fullbacks injured. James Milner could probably fill in and do a decent job there. He's one of those players who doesn't matter where you play him, he'll put a shift in and do something useful. So, again, utility players, you definitely need them in a World Cup. And he is the midfield utility, just like Phil Jones, the defensive utility. So, very, very useful player. And then the midfielders are rounded off by Ross Barkley, who's just been incredible this season. You know, for a young player to be as assured as he has been and just you could see against Manchester City you know the crowd was down 
you know, they didn't really want to win the game because that would probably hand the title to Liverpool. It was a bit of a flat atmosphere. You know, it was a bit of a, a game. You know, Everton weren't going to make the Champions League anymore. It was nothing. And Ross Barkley still put in an outstanding performance. And this is just the level of footballer that he, that he is. You know, the question wasn't whether he'd get in the squad. The question is whether he'll start. If Jack Wilshere isn't 100% fit, you start Ross Barkley. And you start Ross Barkley alongside Steven Gerrard in that midfield. You know, he's very, very good. And I'd like to see him get a few good starts in these friendlies just to get him alongside Gerrard and see how they go. And if he plays well, he could be a starter in that first World Cup game. So those in the midfield are pretty happy, like I mentioned. Probably would have put Carrick in ahead of Lampard, but you can argue that either way. The, the strikers, the four of them that have been picked, Wayne Rooney, guaranteed starter again. First name on the team sheet, him and Gerrard pretty much, you know, in a disappointing Man United team this season, he's been very, very solid. He's got an outstanding goal-scoring record. Admittedly, hasn't done particularly well at international tournaments for England, but I can remember you know, he's had injuries in the run-up to tournaments before. He's been fully fit for a while now, Wayne. As long as he doesn't pick up a niggly injury in the, the, the friendlies, he should be firing on all cylinders, and I'm expecting him to have a big tournament. He's certainly due one. And he's going to be alongside Daniel Sturridge, who is the former English striker in the league. You know, him and Suarez had a devastatingly effective partnership this season. And he gives us something different up front. You know, Rooney's one of those players who will run around the pitch and drop deep to pick the ball up and will get on the ball and spray passes more. Sturridge is always going to be looking at going beyond the, the last defender. You know, more mobile, more pacey than Rooney, and a good finisher as well. And that left foot, right foot combination is always nice to have in the striker. So I expect those two to start. Danny Welbeck again. Like the James Milner style of player, such a hard worker. He'll run and run and run. The only thing you can say about Danny Welbeck is he doesn't score many goals. But his technical ability is phenomenal. You see some of the little tricks and flicks and step overs and little one-twos he does. They're outstanding. And we're in a team now. We've got Sturridge. We've got Rooney. We could play Welbeck on the wing, for example. And he isn't the main source of goals. Because whenever you play Welbeck up front and he's got the, the, the pressure to score all of your goals, England look a little bit more toothless. But when he's a build-up player and a link-up man or you give him a job to mark an Arjen Robben or you, you put him on a Ronaldo, yeah, Ronaldo will probably still beat him every now and again. But Welbeck will put a massive shift in. And he's still technically good going forward. He's a very, very good player in that aspect. And again, those are the sorts of players you need in the World Cup. And you know, I'm pleased that he's in the team because he's a good player. The final striker and somebody, this is just complete in the fairy tale, isn't it? Ricky Lambert, lower league to the World Cup in a few short seasons. You know, there was always a debate whether Andy Carroll or Ricky Lambert should go. And for me, Ricky Lambert was by far and away the striker who should have gone to this squad. And I'm delighted that Roy Hodgson has gone with him over Andy Carroll. Andy Carroll has done nothing since coming back from injury. He's had a bad injury. He's come back. He's put himself about a little bit. He's looked all right. That's not enough to get you into a World Cup squad. You know, Ricky Lambert has had two seasons now of playing very, very well in the Premier League, leading Southampton's line. He takes a phenomenal penalty as well. Let's not forget this. You know, for a, a nation of footballers who seem to have an inability to kick the ball into a bag from 12 yards, having someone who can actually regularly do that will be quite nice. If we do get into a penalty shootout, uh, fingers crossed, touch wood, touch everything, Ricky Lambert will score in the shootout. So... You know, we don't have Darius Vassell to miss a penalty in, in this squad, fortunately. So that, that's the, the 23. You know, I've mentioned a couple of players in the standby list already. I mentioned John Ruddy. You know, John Flanagan, I would have liked to see him get in ahead of Smalling, but it's great to see him on the standby list. He's going to be a decent player for us for a while. John Stones is the real surprising one because you know, he's a very talented young player. You can see him having a big future in the game. Very, very solid. He's tall. You know, Roberto Martinez is obviously going to drill him to be good on the ball. Pass, pass, pass. So he's going to be a phenomenal centre-back. But what does Michael Dawson have to do to get a look into this England squad? You know, I'm very surprised that John Stones has gone in ahead of Michael Dawson. Because let's just say disaster scenario. You know, Gary Cahill gets injured in the friendlies, breaks his leg. Phil Jones gets injured. Phil Jagielka gets injured. All of a sudden, we've got Smalling and John Stones as our starting centre-back pair at the World Cup. That's not great. You know, I would have liked to have seen Michael Dawson there. And possibly what you could have done is wing it a little bit and play Stones in one of the friendlies and then just call him up for one squad. I don't know whether you can actually do that. It'd be nice if you could do that, though, because that's what I would have preferred to have seen. But, again, fingers crossed, disaster doesn't happen and he can get a bit of experience on the standby list and play in a few friendlies and then get, you know, sent back home to watch and hopefully get a taste for it and begin to develop. And then Carrick, I've mentioned already. Defoe, 
he's still one of the best strikers in England in terms of a pure finisher. He's gone to Toronto, and I, I felt if he didn't actually go to Toronto, he would have had a really good chance of getting into the squad. He would have pushed Ricky Lambert all the way, but I felt him travelling over and playing in the uh, the MLS didn't help his cause. But again, if we have a, a striking injury, Defoe is a very, very able replacement. Mentioned Andy Carroll already, and in the final standby player is Tom Cleverley. And fingers crossed there's no injuries so Cleverley doesn't get into the squad. Because I think he's very, very lucky to be part of the 30. I really do. You know, he's been very, very average for a long time now, Tom Cleverley. And I've mentioned him before, so I'm not going to you know, just bash Tom Cleverley unnecessarily for the next five minutes. But you know, if, even if we do have a midfield injury, I'd, you know, John, uh, Michael Carrick, sorry, I was looking at John Stones, but Michael Carrick should be the one who gets called into the squad. So fingers crossed Tom Cleverley doesn't, because he's just he's done so little at Manchester United, and he's done so little for England, that I'm very, very glad that Hodgson hasn't picked him. And I have to say, overall, I'm delighted with this England squad. There's a couple of people who I'd you know, potentially see differently, like I'd, I'd try and get Ashley Cole in the squad and possibly leave Luke Shaw out. But again, that was such a tight decision. I'm, you know, We've got three quality left-backs, three very, very quality left-backs. All of them could start for England and do a very good job. So I'm not incredibly disappointed by that at all, really. I'm looking forward to see Luke Shaw do well at the World Cup. And then Lampard possibly would have got Carrick in ahead of him. But you know, if Hodgson wants to go for a little bit extra experience, considering he's picked all of the kids... That's really good. Now, the starting lineup, I'd probably go for Hart in goal, Johnson, Cahill, Jagielka, Baines, and I'd go for Gerrard. And if Wilshire's fully fit and firing Wilshire, but if not, Ross Barkley is the two sitting in inverted commas midfielders. I'd go for, oh, this is going to be tough. Sterling and Lana as the wingers, Rooney in behind, and then Sturridge up front. And that would be the team, because then you've got explosive pace, you've got a little bit of experience at the heart of it. You've got two very attacking fullbacks. You've got very, very good strikers. You've got them people like Oxlade Chamberlain to come off the bench. And if you need a steadying hand, if you need someone to get a yellow card for the team late on, you can bring Lampard on, you can bring Milner on. If we're up against you know Spain and you want a workhorse, you can start Milner possibly instead of Sterling. And then later on, you can bring Sterling on. I'm actually really happy with the balance of the squad. It's a very, very good squad. And hopefully we can give a good account of ourselves. Personally, if we get to the quarterfinals, that will be a fantastic achievement. I think that's a really, really good achievement. We picked a lot of young players. You know, we aren't one of Europe's greatest teams, but this is a team which will actually give us a good chance of going out there and playing good football and being exciting to watch and actually giving the fans a good run and a good bit of excitement. And it's good at the moment because you know, the level of expectation isn't as high as it has been in the past, which I think is a great thing. You know, so these guys are not going to be under the pressure that like the golden generation were under Sven Euron Eriksson, for example, when everyone was saying we're going to win, we're going to win, we're going to win. Now it's a lot more realistic. You know, quarterfinals would be a fantastic achievement. I think we will get through the group. Yeah, I can see us beating Italy as long as we play well in Manaus. Like I said, if we played Uruguay in Manaus, I'd expect Uruguay to stick seven past us because you know, they're much more used to that South American climate than we're used to playing in rainy Birmingham. You know, it's not the same. But fortunately. Italy, a European team, admittedly a Mediterranean-based European team, so they are more used to the hot weather than we are, but we have a banging chance in that game. Uruguay, they've got some phenomenal players, but they also have some average players. Diego Lugano doesn't get into the West Brom team yet. He starts for Uruguay at the back, so hopefully Sturridge and Waz will be able to tear him apart. And then final game, Costa Rica, you'd expect us to win. It might be goal difference-based. How many we score against them could see us going through or going home. But I think this gives us a good chance. A good chance in a variety of scenarios and situations with a variety of formations. So, guys, once again, thank you so, so much for listening to the video. I'd be very, very interested to hear your opinions on the squad. Who do you think should have got in? Do you think anyone shouldn't have been picked? More strikers, less strikers, fewer defenders? How would you have picked your squad? But once again, thank you so, so much for listening to the video. And as always, have a great day.